afternoon, friends, and welcome to Urban and Sabbatical. Welcome to Urban and Suburban. We're going to have a very fine program today because we're going to get right down to, to some of the big basic problems that are confronting agriculture in the United States today. And uh, we have a very fine gentleman who has flown all the way in here from Corning, Iowa to be with us today. He is the national president of the National Farmers Organization, Mr. Oren Lee Staley. Welcome, Mr. Staley. How are you? Fine. Glad nice to, to have here. you here. Glad to be here. Now, you, you talk about two fellows, two old farm boys flying around. We were flying. Your plane didn't get in here till the... Well, I, got, I came from Moline, Illinois this morning, and uh, I got in here just about 11.45. <laughs> so you had to come from the airport out here, and boy, we just made it. But we certainly are it. proud to have you here with us today. Glad to be here. Because uh, the National Farmers Organization is... Uh, rather new in comparison to right. some of the uh, the other the farm bureau and the grange and so on right. your organization is very new but before we start uh, talking about the organization i want to find out something about you i have been in iowa lived in iowa and i know that's a, one of the greatest farm areas in the whole wide world tell us a little bit about yourself well i really live in northwest missouri our farms in northwest missouri mm -hmm. a 400 acre diversified farmer uh, we just proud that we're farmers. Mm -hmm. I have a wife, three children. So that, that tells the story. I served in the Navy during World War II, attended uh, college, Northwest Missouri State, uh, and uh, still go home and any time I get, uh, mm -hmm. do a little farm work, you know. <laughs> so you're still digging. Right. Well, that's fine. Now we have the background on Mr. Staley. The NFO. Now I know that uh, you city folks have read many times in the papers about NFO and some of the activities that they have been uh, uh, active in during the past uh, two or three years. And uh, I know there's been a lot of misunderstanding among right. city people about your organization. I know there's been a lot of misunderstanding among farmers about right. your organization. This is correct. And I thought that this would be a wonderful time to go to right. the horse's mouth, so to right. speak, and find out. So I have some questions here to ask uh, you, Mr. Staley, and uh, some of them I'm going to may, I may let you have it before it's over. <laughs> I'm sure you can take care of yourself. Yeah. Uh, All right, now let's start right off. NFO, what is NFO? Oh, well, NFO is an organization of farmers made up of farmers and run by farmers because only farmers and producers can be members of the organization. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's a true farm organization. Our purposes and goals are collective bargaining for the American farmer. We believe that basically have believed uh, and when we started talking about collective bargaining just about eight years ago now, no one was talking about collective bargaining in agriculture. Very few thought we had any chance. But as we began to talk about the basic principles and the need of collective bargaining in American agriculture, uh, I guess we might say we were ahead of our time for a while. But now almost everyone recognizes that farmers need uh, bargaining power. Farmers are, well, uh, numerically, uh, quite a considerable number of farmers over a wide area. Uh, buyers are few and more powerful, stronger. And so we're living in a different time and changing conditions where every other segment of the economy is organized except the American farmers. In the past, they've gone to the marketplace and said, what will you give me? We're organizing for the purpose of acting as businessmen, putting a price on our products to compete in an organized economy. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, we've had uh, so-called co-ops for many years. Uh, that have, are supposed to be helping the farmer. Now, what is the difference between your organization, the National Farmers Organization, and the so-called cooperative organization? Well, uh, I think in principle, somewhat the same, uh, uh, but here's the, the basic difference. First, we uh, have organized uh, not to go into business. Our bylaws prohibit us from going into business. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, now, this doesn't mean we're critical of the cooperatives that have been in the business uh, ventures. Mm -hmm. They perform mm -hmm. valuable services yes. for the farmers and their community. But we're living in a different time, and the uh, cooperative structure cannot meet the pricing problems because they are organized in one given area, and even sometimes two or three states. But you cannot deal with volume buyers uh, that are over the entire nation that are buying in every agricultural state with just a group in one area. You have to compete uh, industry-wide. And a more important point, undoubtedly, to be considered is the fact that you must work on all of the commodities if you're going to really be effective. So if you're going to have effective bargaining in American agriculture, you have to work on all commodities, raise their, the prices in a general balance, or you'll ruin the bargaining power that you've gained. Mm -hmm and you uh, bring it up to stabilize prices through contracts. This is the basic difference. I see. Now, a couple of years ago, NFO came into prominence during their holding action. Yes. Now, exactly what did they expect to gain, and what did you actually accomplish? Well, of course, this is where there's more misunderstanding about NFO than any other part of our program. Uh, people did not understand that the purpose of a holding action was to test the uh, farmer's reaction, support, and, of course, to prove our bargaining power to the buyers. Mm -hmm. Now, the buyers had refused to deal with NFO as such, as an organization of farmers, to deal with NFO members as a group. So, consequently, what they in refusing to meet and deal with the NFO members as a group it meant we had to first get recognition and we had to prove to the processors that we had enough volume of production brought together over a large enough area that they could not operate their plants in an efficient manner unless they accepted this production from NFO members as such mm -hmm. with the gold of contracts that would stabilize farmers' prices at fair levels, take care of any surpluses that might develop or exist, and in other words, bargain for a fair, equitable price, but get stability in agriculture. Mm -hmm. All righty, now let me ask you this question. If NFO gets the price that they're asking for, now how will this affect the prices in the stores? That's what the, the mama, when she goes to the uh -huh. store, that's what she wants to know. Now, how's this going to affect the, the price of food? Food keeps going up as it is. Well, I think that this is a real critical uh, question that's being discussed in the American households mm -hmm. today. And I think it's one that we need to examine closely. First, I'd like to say, and I forgot to mention, that we were successful in the 64 holding action. Processes are now dealing with NFO mm -hmm. members mm -hmm. as such. And we've been able to raise, the NFO has, mm -hmm. as a group. We've been able to raise the general price level on many commodities. And I know we'll get into the details on that before the program's yeah. over. But yeah. uh, what happens is, as far as the consumer is concerned, they f uh, fail to recognize that food is still the best buy in America. One hour's wages will buy more food than ever before in the history of our country. Mm -hmm. Now, this may sound uh, a little foreign or a little uh, unreasonable to a housewife that's looked at uh, what they paid for the groceries last week or, or today that mm -hmm. they're buying, mm -hmm. but they have to go back and look at what has happened to the price of a new automobile, uh, the doctor bill, or anything else they buy, mm -hmm. a suit of clothes, and they have to recognize that the reason the prices on everything else has gone up is that their wages have gone up. If they're in business, their profits have gone up. And so consequently, they have been going up at a faster economic rate in every other segment of the economy than the American farmers have. The prices that the farmers receive have been far below the prices that other segments of the economy receive for, for their wages or for their, or their profits. Mm -hmm. And we have not been sharing as farmers in the general uh, economic increased prosperity in this nation. Uh, possibly I have a chart or two here maybe oh, that, that I yes, brought along. We can, uh, we'll just uh, pull these charts up now and uh, yes. I'll hold them up there and you can we'll well, get uh, some shots of them here. On this I'll have to thing. take a look and see which mm -hmm. chart here is oh, first. You uh, can watch it right on the monitor. Oh, well, there, fine, David. fine. This will be fine. Well, now this, uh, not long ago, there were a lot of comments about uh, the price of food in New York City. So the Secretary of Agriculture was invited to go down and explain it. And so these are some of the charts that were used to show this. And in the one cent price increase on a quart of milk, uh, now this is what the farmer received. Mm -hmm. But the price of milk in New York City, retail price, went up two to three cents a quart. Mm -hmm. Now this is uh, two to three hundred percent uh, of the price that the farmer increase yes. was. Now this, uh, now we're not saying that the other people shouldn't have a profit or shouldn't have a fair price. What we're trying to say is 
that if wages are conti to continue at a profitable level or the present level, or if profits are continue at the present level, the people that work, the people that have a business cannot expect the American farmer to have a substandard wage because what's happening, and one of the reasons uh, that uh, it's real serious is that the youth in American agriculture has been leaving the farms. The average age of farmers is 58 years today. Mm -hmm. And with the average age of farmers at 58 years, it means that uh, the, the kids that have been growing up on the farm just haven't been staying on the farm. And a quart of milk just doesn't happen to be in New York City or Dayton or a pound of beefsteak. Uh, it just doesn't happen to be in the supermarket. It takes an investment. It takes labor. And what has happened is that the youth in American agriculture has been able to pick up a lunch bucket or go into a small business many times uh, with much less investment or maybe practically no investment, get much more return than you can get for the big investment in agriculture. So if America, if the American people are going to have the food they want and desire and that they can have, they're going to have to recognize that they're going to have to pay a fair price to the farmers because the kids that are growing up on the farm today, the children, that are reared on the farm, they're going to stay there only because of an economic reason. And an economic reason means fair right. income to the American farmer. Mm -hmm. Now, let's look at this chart here and see. All right. Well, well now, here's, here shows what has happened as far as the value of wheat and the retail price uh, in 1950. A, a, price, a, a loaf of bread cost 14 cents. The same size a loaf of bread today cost 22 cents, just 16 years later. Mm -hmm. But the farm value was only 2 and a half cents uh, or was two and a half cents in the 14 cent loaf, but today it's only uh, seven tenths of a cent more, mm -hmm. uh, and the price has gone up eight cents a loaf. Uh, I think that's self explanatory. Shows farm incomes dragging far behind. Right. All righty, now let's take a look at this one. Well, now this is the increase in a loaf of bread and the price in New York in just, in just uh, one year's time, July 1st, 1965 to 66, the price of wheat that went into the loaf of bread has increased a half a cent to the farmer. But the, the price of that loaf of bread went up three cents in, the, in New York. Mm -hmm. And the increase to the farmer was uh, one and a half cent. cent. That's right. This is right. Now here, here's a graph chart that's yes. interesting. And here's a graph chart that uh, is very inter interesting because this shows what has happened and how the study uh, retail food price has gone up and the level that has gone up and using a hundred as a basis there and then when you, when you start using all these these bases here of a hundred and you notice here that the price at the, uh, the retail price has continued to go up as you go on out but then you look down here and the price is received by farmers even though this has gone up you look down across here and you notice that what has happened is you've had this level here that's considerably below while the other price trend has generally gone up. Uh, this just shows that uh, the farmer certainly has not been profiting from higher food costs. And of course, food is still the best buy. We don't want to forget that in America. Mm -hmm. one, age is, uh, one hour's wages will still buy more food than ever before in the history of our country. And last year, the disposable income, the American people, only 18 and 2 tenths percent of the disposable income was spent for food. Now, this is against 26 cents a few years ago, or 26 percent, really. All righty. Now, this shows here the disposable personal income, how far the personal income of the farmers has been dragging behind. This is the disposable income of the non-farm population as you go on up here. And this is the disposable income of the farm population. Last year, even though with some increase in price, the farmers only received their per capita income was only two-thirds of that of the non-farm population. And this is the reason that the youth has been leaving in American agriculture. Simple, pure economics. All righty. Now, let me, let's get down here, uh, Mr. Staley, to just some, some brass taxes. As I said. Now, the farmer, uh, all through the history of our country, has been a great individualist. He had right. been able to, uh, in the, the years before, he'd been able to, transact his own business and do as he pleased. But now that, that agriculture and the need for food, not only in our country, but the world over, has become so great that this farmer now cannot operate as an, as an individual. He has got to operate as a group, isn't that? The, a, that's the thinking behind your whole... Part of an industry. Mm -hmm. And what you've said is so true. And the other point is that the, the whole structure of buying and selling in America is 
is uh, so much different than uh, our forefathers as far as they were uh, concerned because uh, farmers used to be great in number, but they used to make up, well, first, uh, almost all the population, then down to 60 percent, mm -hmm. down to 50 percent, and right on down until now about 7 percent of the total population of farmers. But they still produce about 100 percent of the food, although exported percentage-wise not really a uh, great value, uh, generally on most commodities. Well, this means that with this, uh, with this number of farmers still numbering uh, into the millions, uh, three and a half million farm operators supposedly, but uh, many of those are working off the farm and, and you get down to quite a lot smaller number that really do most of the producing of agricultural commodities. But these people uh, out here are really selling to buyers that buy volume, that uh, buy all over the nation, and uh, frankly, uh, it's just a change of climate and the economics involved that the farmers no longer the individuals. They can't That's do right. anything they can't, about it. They can't operate anymore that way. Uh, last week, Mr. Staley, from our news service, uh, this story came over, and I'd like to read part of this to you and to the folks and then uh, have your comments on it. All right. It. Mm -hmm. uh, million dollar farms will become prominent in tomorrow's agriculture said two leading economists attending a meeting in, uh, in Maryland, Dr. Walter Butcher and Normal Whittleski. They were at uh, Washington State University, had these comments. They said farm, farming in the near future is likely to have more in common with today's factories than with many of today's farms. Do you believe that? Well, I think that the, uh, really the answer to that question is whether the present farmers group their production together in sufficient numbers to be able to bargain effectively to get a fair price. Mm -hmm. If they get a fair price, then they will be able to maintain an individual uh, type investment. Mm -hmm. Now, if they do not, and this gets back to the age of farmers 58 years of age, most of the land today that when the farmer leaves because of age, because of health, is bought by the adjoining farm. This soon means not a $100,000 investment, it soon means 200000 mm -hmm. At some point, this investment gets so large that there is no way for a young man to really start because yeah. the investment is prohibitive. Now, the only reason that the young people are not staying on the farm is, and certainly we know that a $100,000 investment is a good investment yeah, well, in any business. You bet it is. But the return on the investment has been so low even if it's a hundred or $200,000 farm, that it's been so low that it was not attractive enough they could beat it with a lunch bucket, with no investment, yeah. without the risk. Now, if uh, this investment continues to get higher, then it'll get so individuals cannot really invest in it, and at this point, corporate agriculture will take over, and that's what you're talking about in a million-dollar operation. But, this but those people will organize. Yeah, but these, this is not what you're in favor of, is no. it? No. Because you're in favor of keeping this individual out there farming the way he wants to farm and growing what he wants right. to grow. This is the basis of a free enterprise society. Mm -hmm. And really, if you get into a large operations like that, you lose the individual initiative. Well, this is a pretty, a pretty forceful statement, I'm going to say, but I, I want to be sure that it's understood. When you have lose the individual initiative in agriculture, so there isn't the desire to be there to milk that cow because you own the cow, to be there when the sow fares mm -hmm. because you own the sow, or to put in the extra hours to raise the corn or grain because it's yours. Mm -hmm. When they have to employ the help to do it, you lose the individual incentive, the individual initiative that's made America great. That's right. And it's really no different than the communes uh, or mm -hmm. the collective farms in uh, Russia because they've lost their incentive and there's never been an agriculture in the world that has ever been efficient, that was not a private, family-type agriculture. We don't want to see it destroyed. That's right. These fellows go on to say that says farm sizes will be way up, farm numbers way down, million-dollar capitalization will be commonplace. Volume output will approximate today's factory production. Well, I think that this is a good warning to the consuming public. Mm -hmm. Unless, and we're making great gains, because we have been able to now bring enough strength together in 25 states to be able to deal with seven of the nation's leading processors in meat, many of the nation's leading processors in dairy and grain. Mm -hmm. And because we've been able to deal with them, we're able to use our production that's raising the general price level. And on the commodities that we've been working on, this is where we've see the, seen the price rises. 
But if farmers do not continue to develop this bargaining power and this type of agriculture that they're predicting, and these are not the only uh, yes, influential people. They, these people are doing it. Some of the credit structures yeah. beginning to point toward this. If this type of agriculture comes about, they will organize. They will be the same people with the investment that they invest in Manila large corporations in America. And they've learned the first thing they have to do is to determine their cost. After they've determined their cost, to decide what price they're going to have to have in order to get a fair return on the investment. Mm -hmm. Now, this is what will happen. And with that type of an agriculture, with much less efficiency than the type of ownership we have today, American people will really pay the price for food. That's right. Now, let's... Uh, um, keep glancing at the clock here because there's so many things we want to talk about. Now, let's get back to your organization as to how it works as far, uh, and, and now we're talking right to the right, farmer. Right. In, in farmer. relation to the farmer, how, uh, for instance, does uh, you have a, a group here in, is it a county? Do you work by counties or do you yes. work by districts or, or how do they go? Well, what we do, we organize, uh, I say we organize, it's farmers, only farmers yes. doing yes. it. And they, they find the farmers interested in the county. Uh, they explain what we're doing. Uh, it used to be what we were trying to do, but now what we're doing, the progress we're making. And how they explain this program to them for the purpose of them explaining it to their neighbors. Now, after enough of them have joined, uh, first it takes a minimum of 25. We get much more, many more than that. Uh, but they are the real businessmen in this county because it takes a real businessman to understand what we're talking yes, about. Yes. And so this is the reason that the leading farmers in most of the communities uh, immediately grasp this business approach. And then they set up their organization with the county, and then when the counties are organized within a congressional district, a congressional district organization is set up, and then a state. But the difference between our organization, the basic structure, and it's very vital, is that the membership in the county elect the delegates that go to a national convention where the policies are determined right from the grassroots. We had about 10,000 members there that had been elected last year at our yes, national yes, convention in St. Louis. And they sit there and they make the decisions. This is a grassroots approach. Farmers from this county, this county, and every county throughout the 25 state area. So this is the way the policies are really, but they have to be established, but they must be farmers and producers in order to be members. Mm -hmm. Our organization cannot go into business. We have only one thing to offer, and that's the opportunity for farmers to join together. Uh, they own their production first, uh, but they must bargain before it's sold or they lose their bargaining mm -hmm. time. Now, just, uh, just how does it work? Now, say that I'm a, I'm a member of your organization and I'm, I've got some nice beef cattle. Mm -hmm. Time comes to sell this beef cattle. Now, how, how do you help me? Well, there's, there's really two phases at the present time. Uh, and this is the reason we had to have our holding actions. Our goal were contracts with processes where the price will be determined at least 12 months in advance. There will be a changing price within the year because of the difference in the cost of production. There will be the, the ability to change the incentives uh, uh, to well, in order to get lower, lighter weight cattle in, if they're finished cattle or hogs or such. Now, this, this is the processor you're talking about. You're no, not talking one. about the man that's selling it to the processor. No, this is the farmer. But now the, the contracts will be between the farmer and the, uh, the processor. But in this phase, we now have it where the processors are accepting supply from NFO members as such. And this gives the members the opportunity to move their production into a new marketing pattern. They're not doing it in one state or one area. They're doing it all over. In, in the ability to use their production to bargain means simply that by moving production and volume in a new marketing pattern, they're doing it here in Ohio, mm -hmm. moving into new marketing patterns on a volume basis meets a volume buyer's need. This, this does a good job for the buyer. Mm -hmm. It also makes it possible for the farmers to use their production and volume to be effective. And the next thing that happens is that as this volume moves out of an area, the ex remaining buyers must compete more to get their supply, mm -hmm. and then they have to go out into other areas, and this sets off a chain reaction which raises the general price level. Okay. And this is the reason that our bargaining efforts have the effect now of raising the general price level. Mm -hmm. Now, we, uh, our director at the moment, who's taking our pictures here, is a farmer. Fine. And he has written down a couple of questions. He says he believes in the NFO organization, and he wanted to know is how come the NFO did not hold back 
their grain and livestock longer when you have the holding action? Well, uh, of course, in our grain program, we have in-position grain sales. And these in-position grain sales make a chance for the, or give the farmers the opportunity to pick the time of year they want to sell. The first thing that they must do in grain, and we're advising our members now, is to store at harvest time, hold, and then bargain together in the a period of time that they want to sell their grain. Now, the reason that you cannot hold on livestock uh, over uh, only about a certain length yes, of time. because they lose uh, their... Well, yes, and you, and you increase the tonnage, but you had to hold, and we held 43 days, and we accomplished our objectives because the processors realized that they had to have this volume represented, and so we've been making progress in bargaining since. We, now we can use our production. This is an added two. We have to be ready to use a holding action if processors refuse to bargain in good faith, but we think with farmers supporting the efforts and realizing it's not the nickel, it's not the dime, mm -hmm. it's the dollars that you're counting and the general price rise that you're bringing about uh, through your bargaining effort. Now, this first effort was really getting the big foot in the door, wasn't it? Yes, and we had, uh, we had, I believe, four test holding actions. Uh, we didn't have this many in this area. We organized out there, moved on across the country. Uh, we're organized now in uh, almost every productive county from the Pennsylvania line to the western areas of Kansas and Nebraska and the Canadian border in the Tennessee, Kentucky, Oklahoma. Uh, but we used those test actions, then a big action in 62, and then a big action in 64. The action in 62 was about 30 days, and 64 about 43. But the 64 one is the one that really convinced the processors. But the, the farmer getting more money is not necessarily going to raise the cost of food to any great amount, right? Percentage-wise, no. I would not want to say to the American consumer that it's not going to cost some more. Uh, certainly it will. But as far as, and they use the figures there, and they've got to expect it. I mean, if, if they're working in a factory producing an automobile, the price has been going up on that. If they're, if they're working in any plant, the price has been going up on the product, and they've gotten better wages. So they can't expect the farmer uh, for them to always buy food uh, cheap. Uh, well, just, he's, just, uh, he's having to go out and buy all these, these expensive machines because a farmer nowadays has to have them or he can't operate. This is a tremendous price has been going up to right. get the price for his... Uh, his products has not kept pace. Right. Mm -hmm. But the percentage of increase uh, that the farmer gets is very small. Fine. Now, we have about a minute and a half for you to kind of sum this up a little bit, and I'll just give you your head now, about a minute. All right. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to visit well, we with you. We appreciate having this you. This is a good agricultural area. I think that I would say that the most important thing is happening in American agriculture today. And the biggest story in American agriculture is the farmers' acceptance of the NFO collective bargaining program. For, many of, for a long time, there was a great misunderstanding about the collective bargaining program, the NFO. Now it is being accepted. Farmers are seeing progress made in bargaining. They're seeing the NFO's efforts succeed. They are now realizing that we are raising the general price level through our bargaining efforts. Now is the time for the farmers to realize they must bargain industry-wide, that they must be under one organization and one bargaining effort to coordinate their efforts. We thank you very much. Mr. Oren Lee Staley, who is the national president of the National Farmers Organization, has come all the way from, did you come from Missouri or Iowa today? Well, I, I came from Iowa last night to, from uh, Moline uh, early this morning. We thank you very much. We've had a very fine time. Nice to have met you. and. We hope that we've kind of straightened out maybe NFO in your mind. We'll see you folks next Saturday. Thank you very much. We hope you have a wonderful weekend and a nice holiday. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Appreciate Taylor. the opportunity.